Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Mike Villeneuve. I'm with the Geological Survey of Canada. I've been with the Geological Survey of Canada for close to 30 years. I sometimes wear that as a badge of honor and other times a badge of shame. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I would say I started my career as a geochronologist. So in this room, I am an outsider to a large extent looking in. I'm not a metallogenist. I'm not, a, not trained as a mineral deposit a specialist. Uh, I'm barely trained as a mapper. Um, and uh, so, you know, that brings certain advantages and disadvantages. I uh, can sometimes see, see the bigger picture for the trees. Other times, the trees are important. And, uh, and it gets lost on me. Um, but I'd like to sort of focus on four key key points here. Is that the one? Uh, innovation yes, slide? innovation slide. Yep, you can put that up. Uh, so the first is what is innovation? Everyone loves to talk about innovation. Governments love to talk about innovation. This room loves to talk about innovation. We're all going to be innovative. Innovation will save us. That will be our salvation. A couple of years ago at Ken's, uh, when I attended the, another one of Ken's events and Charles' events, um, you know, I've, I kind of got it around to the Humpty Dumpty uh, definition of innovation. Innovation is a word that means exactly what I want it to mean, nothing more, nothing less. And that seems to be how people use it. In reality, I think the best definition of innovation is it has to provide an economic or societal benefit. So somewhere in all of this talk of innovation, you have to arrive at it either makes life better for society, Canadians in our case, or you have to generate economic output, economic value. Um, so I just keep that in mind when we talk about innovation, and natural resources continually score low, the resource industries continually score low on innovation, the mining and exploration, or mining industry in particular scores low on all surveys of innovation. And the Conference Board of Canada actually, I think it was them, got tired of wondering why industry, the mineral industry kept scoring low on innovation. And so they did a study, and the answer was, well, because you don't have to be innovative. That's what Craig said. There's plenty of success, why, why change? And I contrast that with the forestry industry, though who also was similarly relatively low innovation, pulp and paper, uh, softwood lumber, until all of a sudden, holy crap. <laughs> and it happened fast. I w forestry's in our department, and I can tell you it happened fast, without warning. And amazingly, they, that's what has driven that industry in Canada to become incredibly innovative all of a sudden. I look at the stuff that's coming out of the forestry industry now, you know, turning trees into different bioplastics, into uh, different genomic uh, end members, uh, it, it, into different products that were unheard of. That's what's driving the innovation. So all of this talk may be for naught unless there's that impetus behind us, that, that fear of complete failure and collapse. I just say that, you know, whether you can create your own destiny or whether you need that to create the destiny, I think is an open question. Um, so uh, the um, second thing I want to talk about is this. It ties in a little bit to what Robbie was talking about. Um, in fact, what Robbie talks about is pretty much everything that we've been considering within the government from a policy framework, and that's where I'm coming at it now as a geologist, geochronologist, but also from the policy side of government. Um, the, the whole uh, idea of, you know, where does government put its money to get the best bang for buck? We're starting to look at it in the framework of, you know, there's discovery. To, to get a successful mine, or metals out of the ground, there's discovery aspect, and we, we fund that through programs like TGI and JAM and Nextech in the past, and there's the economic side, and we fund that through uh, the uh, mining exploration tax credits, through uh, you know paying for infrastructure of roads that, that might not otherwise exist. There's a social license aspect that's become important. And industry 
uh, you know, there's a whole regulatory regime around that or expectation regime around that now. And in the industry, I remember uh, attending roundups where, you know, there were industry was yelling at ministers about the need to actually go in and do consultations. It's accepted practice now. Yeah. The one piece that, you know, and I put this out, and uh, I put it out before to industry uh, people, and it, the reaction I got was overtly hostile. <laughs> so this is not government policy, this is not being imposed, this is me speaking myself, um, is the environmental side. The typical response to environmental considerations right now is when we get to the EA, we'll worry about that. And I liken it a bit, it's akin to a developer in a city finding a, large, a parcel of land in a residential district and coming in going, okay, we're going to put up a shopping center here, regardless of what the consequences are, and we're going to fight you until we get the shopping center put in. Um, okay, and if we can't put up a shopping center, we're going to put up a 50-story condo. Instead of, okay, what are the types of things that we can put on that property? So are we exploring for low-impact deposit in that area? And I think we need to change the conversation from a, bi a, um, a bifurcated uh, conversation of the land's either open for access or closed for access to one that it may be open for access for certain types of deposits because of their known environmental parameters around the development of them. And there are, and that consideration can take place early on in the exploration process. When you're collecting data there, there are some indicators and governments can help by setting some of those frameworks that, that actually will, are useful at, uh, from place to place in determining it. And they're going to be different from place to place. You know, finding something high up on a mountain where you want to do heat bleaching and everything runs down into the rivers is different than finding it in a fairly flat spot where you can control such things. Um, so that's uh, one of the, the, the pieces uh, that, that we're trying to pull together. Um, I put this slide up because the, um, I, I just want to illustrate that for us in Canada, our focus is on science. And science as the uh, fundamental driver of discovering the new targeting elements. So you can run this, you know, there's the mineral deposit models, regional geoscience, but the ore system thematic research can tell you what sort of elements you should be targeting, which then drives what technology needs to be developed. But we can run it the other way. We get new technology that we can measure things we couldn't measure before that, tell, that lets us target new things we couldn't target before, which then informs us about the, the ore deposit. It's philosophical. There's no right or wrong. I will say, in general, in Canada, we tend to drive it this way. In general, and very general, in Australia, it, ten it tends to drive the other way. And it's not a right or wrong. It's, uh, it, it's, it's um, uh, the philosoph philosophy that goes in behind it. I will say that in Canada, our view, our philosophy is, is I think, grounded on that science is in the long-term additive, additive. It has a short-term impact, but it has long-term additive benefit. Technology development has short-term impact, but it's replaceable. Eventually, a new technology comes along that, that basically supersedes the original one. So taking a short-term view, and a lot of companies, when I talk to them, are more concerned about the short-term view, they take, they take the view that the technology development is what you need. In, from a governmental, societal standpoint, we're concerned about the long-term sustainability of the industry. So that's partly why in Canada we've, we've specifically chosen to run it that way. It's not exclusionary, but it's, it's you know, you, you orient in a certain way. Um, the next thing I'd like to sort of talk about quickly is just the sense of does a pump need to be primed? Um, I gave Ken a brief synopsis, synopsis of my uh, waiting for the Earth Science Godot uh, talk, and maybe someday he'll invite me to give the, the fully seasoned talk on that. But if I look back, there's a sense that um, through history, I think in geosciences, there's been four main 
uh, discoveries that have really driven a societal change. The first is Steno with the law of superposition. All of a sudden, not, not everything happened at the same time. The uh, second, uh, second was the uh, William Smith map, mapping, so you can correlate in space. The third is uh, Charles Darwin and the, uh, the evolutionary, um, uh, the um, survival of the fittest, uh, where all of a sudden now you have relative uh, ability to do relative time, but you also took man out of being the center and specialist, specialized animal, and it became part of the overall development of the, the world, and that changed. We still argue about it today. It has an impact in society. And the most recent one was plate tectonics. And Vine Matthews Morley in 1968, I think it was, didn't sit there going, this is going to revolutionize the world. They're incremental, but that was the tipping point. And all of a sudden, now we have a new paradigm, and every piece of data that's collected gets put in the new paradigm, and we rethink everything. It changes where how our understanding of earthquakes and earthquake risk and volcanic volcanoes and volcano risk of where ore deposits show up, how they show up, it led to mineral deposit models. You can't predict those things. You, you know, and, and it comes around and you go, oh, this is the next big thing, and it fizzles out. And, and so to a certain extent, maybe we're living within the, um, the uh, broader we're buffeted by external winds rather than us actually being able to do much about it. And one of the consequences is I think we're sitting in this in a point in time similar to where uh, origin of species sat in about the 1900s. You kind of ran out of the big grand ideas that needed to be tested and you started into the more data collection. More data collection, let's collect more species, let's collect more fossils, put them in museums, we'll write the papers around those. They're all valuable science not diminishing the science, but they didn't really move the bar very far. Plate tectonics, we're probably at the stage where we have a pretty good understanding of how it works. Most of the, uh, a lot of the studies that are done are, you know, this is the way, here's the evolutionary history of the such and such belt of such and such area. That's okay, but it's not moving, it's not changing the paradigms very much. Um, and, uh, Excuse me for a minute here. Um, the um, uh, the last piece, which I now have forgotten because my computer is closed off and I've gone over time. I know. I think that's, uh, that's principally, um, <coughs> oh, the heat, I forget my password. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> um, anyway, that's uh, principally what I wanted to say. I will say the other piece is for, for governments, you know, we're, you get on my level, they're agnostic about where the money goes. It can go to Metal Earth, it can go to, um, it can go to CIMIC, it can go to universities, it can go to geological surveys, it can go to Geoscience BC, it can go to industry directly. Those are all the hows of what we, we fund, but, um, and, uh, but on the flip side is, you know, if government uh, geological surveys are valuable entities, it needs to be said. PAC does say that, I think on behalf of the industry, but it is something that, that it often gets turned into the negatives. I'll tell a bit of a tale out of school. Um, we got response from uh, one of the ore systems in uh, TGI-4 when they were interviewed they came back pretty much negative and say, well, most of this stuff we already knew. And it was proprietary, and yeah, so TGI may not have done a great job of, of moving the yardstick. But the response was almost, well, maybe we should just stop funding that. 
that whole system. Since we're not making a difference, maybe we should just exit that and put our resources to where we are making a difference. That can be the way government responds, the way uh, people outside of this business respond. So don't take it as a given that they have to fund it. So, so I'll leave it at that. Sorry, I've probably taken too much time. So. Thanks, mate.